chance to catch up guys. We are live. I'll pin this to the top of the page. Hi guys, we are live. Um, I just wait for a few people to come in, um, and we'll we'll start. My wife is here. Oh. <laughs> My wife's downstairs. <laughs> here we go. Let's give it a couple more minutes. Evening Joanna, evening Teresa. Hello. Hi Julian. Hi guys, welcome to the Accidental Journalist Live and Undrugged episode 28. Um, as always, we're sponsored by Armour Scaffolding, uh, No Means City Clothing, um, and in cooperation with uh, HMP Connections on Facebook. Um, we are with uh, former criminal and author uh, Terry Anton. Um, and we're going to be talking about his life, his experience, um, and a little bit about his book later on. Thank you for coming on, Terry. Okay, thank you. Good, good to have you on. Um, I like to take my guests back to the start. Um, so let, let's go back to uh, your childhood and how it was there. Yeah. Um, for most of my childhood, it was okay. You know, uh, up until I was about 12 years of age, my mother one day turned around and said, you know, your father, well, he's not your father. Apparently your father's dead. He died in a, in a car accident. Uh, to put it bluntly, it really messed up my life from then on. Uh, I went from a, a quiet child to somebody that was forever getting in trouble. I had the cane off all the teachers. All the teachers that gave the cane, I got it off. Uh, I, I was very lucky not to get expelled, actually. And um, when I left, um, I think the reason my mother said what she said was so that it would turn me against my stepdad and um, it, it certainly did that but it also made me a, a right bad bugger you know what I mean uh, and this new stepdad it turns out he was a paedophile uh, also a very controlling paedophile um, thankfully, he never touched me, but it was close at times. But he was more um, physical and um, mental control and abuse, which obviously impacted on me in time because uh, I was getting bullied at home from him constantly. And I was getting bullied at school. So it was 24 7 bullying. Um, when I left school, I went working for him. So the bullying continued. And we used to do, we used to work for other people, you know, on the building game. And quite often, he would punch me full on. I was about. 11 stone, something like that. He was about, not far off, 20 stone, big lad. And 
quite a few times he would lay me out full fist in front of customers. So obviously his business didn't do very well. Um, to escape, I suppose, looking back to escape the abuse and everything, because my mother, although she noticed it, she never really did anything about it. You know, um, so basically I, I went, I started going out thieving. I was breaking into warehouses mainly and uh, breaking into safes and things like that. And within a couple of years of that, you know, constantly going out every night, thieving. All right, I had plenty of money. Um, but eventually I got caught <clears throat> and I was thrown in Risley. And if you've ever heard of Risley, it used to be nicknamed Grizzly Risley. And it was. Yeah. Um, there was a, a Mancunian guy that I was padded up with. And for some reason, he got it into his head that if I committed suicide, they'd let him out. So every time the lights went out, he used to beat 10 colours of crap out of me. Nothing that showed, you know, there are no bruises as such, but, and then he, after a while, he'd start with the mental abuse. But obviously it didn't work, I'm still here. Mm. Um, and thankfully, it's like I was on my mound in Risley. So it, I only had to spend a week with him. And then, uh, you know, I'd come back that night and I'd have another pub mate and so on. Altogether, um, I did two ball stools, back to back, more or less. Um, I did 18 months without a break from one of my ball stools. Because basically I was stupid enough to, <laughs> believe it or not, and this is quite embarrassing, I parked a car on the main Manchester to Glasgow train line. And obviously the train hit it, and I got 18 months for that. Um, and, and that was due to drink, you know. For about all the time, you know, I, I started drinking like everybody else, but I tended to drink to excess. I did everything to excess. I don't know why. Um, and in no time at all, I started drinking the heavy duty lagers and things like that and smoking pot. Uh, I was supposed to forget everything that I've been through. And in no time at all, I was hooked and I just couldn't put it down. It took me roughly 18 years to put it down. And I got into all kinds of scrapes. Uh, I've been nearly beaten to death in uh, Tower Bridge. And to be honest with you, I can't understand why. I was beaten up. I think I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. They basically beat me up with pickaxe handles and things like that and uh, knocked me unconscious. But thankfully, I come round with an uh, ambulance woman over me. Um, it was six of one and a half and us with the other. Um, in that 18 years, I was forever getting in trouble mainly petty stuff. Uh, I lost my license. I lost girlfriends. I lost a wife. Never lost me all, but I was very close to it at times. The most embarrassing thing that I did while drinking was I lived in the East End of London and I didn't know, but I had a little indiscretion with my curtains while living in a basement flat and I lived on the main road. So you can imagine, I thought that I was completely 
uh, in my own privacy. But I wasn't <laughs> quite a crowd outside. And uh, that is basically how I got into the papers, the tabloids, because they got hold of it, twisted it to, to suit themselves like they normally do. And um, it, it, that happened in 1985, and I found out about it, about the papers in 1993. But by that time, the abuse that I'd suffered on a daily basis, because I was getting physically attacked in the street, I was getting verbally abused in the street again, and I, st I fell ill with dystonia. And anybody that knows about dystonia, it, in my case, it's like muscle spasms in my neck. Uh, it's quite painful, um, very debilitating. And when I found out in 93, obviously, I was, I was too ill to defend myself with the papers. So, so sorry. So you say the papers, this is the tabloids. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and how did, what did the papers say about you? What, um, what sort of things were they claiming yeah. that you did? Well, there were, there were all kinds of uh, allegations, um, mainly lies. Um, and to be honest with you, I, what it was, I opened the paper up one day and I saw my face looking back at me. And what the paper, that particular paper, had been doing is I'd been sending letters to my ex-girlfriend. And as you can imagine, being an ex-girlfriend, they were quite fruity, the letters. And I didn't know, but she was passing the letters on. Uh, so basically that tabloid was printing me letters, right. which, as you can imagine, it's quite embarrassing. But because of my dystonia, uh, panic attacks, my alcoholism, everything like that all combined, I had no defence. I couldn't have fought myself out of a, a paper bag. You know, it was, I was a complete wreck. Then within weeks of finding out, um, I was attacked in my own home by 15 blows gang raped and left for dead. Um, as you can imagine, that was, that really, really did impact on me. And, you know, it, for about 18 months, I've tried constantly to commit suicide, mainly by taking, taking overdoses. I never, never ended up in, in hospital or anything like that but it mentally it really impacted on me in a big way um one day well one night i found out who the ringleader of the gang was and i went after him well i intended to go after him and i had a, a meat cleaver and I fully intended to take his head off. But thankfully, I had a moment of clarity. And I was like seconds away from doing it. And I thought, if I do this, I'm going to be ending up doing 15, 20 years inside for a scumbag. So I just went right past him. And it was that night, that was the turning point for me that made me do something about me drinking. And it didn't happen overnight because I was quite bad with the drink. And it took me something like four years to actually put it down. I went to one to one counselling. Uh, luckily, I found a good counsellor. And eventually, I hit AA. Uh, and to date, I'm over 24 years sober. 
Nice. Do you know what I mean? I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't I have no intention of picking a, a fag up or a drink up, but I can only say that just for today. Mm. Um, my life is completely different. You know, I've met somebody that's, you know, she's a, she's a diamond. Um, yeah, um, and that's all, all due to sobriety, mm. you know. I've had to, like my family, I've had to kick into touch because basically they didn't want me to stop drinking because by me stopping drinking, they lost control over me because they were feeding off me from, from behind, you know. Um, so obviously I've no family around me. I've just got my wife and her family and they're all genuine people. And I'm in a happy place. You know, I'm not at Turf Moor, but I'm at a happy place. That's nice. it. <laughs> nice. So tell me about the book. About the book, right. Well, obviously it's an autobiography. Can I say it in a minute? Autobiography. And it's obviously a lot more than what I've said on this. Um, it took me a, a few years to write it. And in that time, I had to have CBT. Um, but they couldn't really do anything because I kept visiting it. You know, I kept visiting my past. Um, and I suffered for a while with PTSD, not just because of the book, but even, even today I do suffer, um, you know, with PTSD. It's, it's, uh, I don't know if it's because of the rape or something like that. I have no idea, but um, you know, it's a it's a day at a time, and I don't work anymore. I can't work. Uh, I'm dried up now. <laughs> That's all right. um, so, how did you begin to um, look at the trauma of of, of um... You, you know, getting over uh, gang rape, how, how do you, you know? Well, I think being that I met, I had a one-to-one -one counsellor. Uh, she went into it with me as well. You know, it wasn't just about drink, mm. but she, she was quite a good counsellor because over the years I've had a few counsellors um, and basically most of them were just sounding boards. But this particular counsellor, it, it was like she'd had a, a problem, the way she spoke to me. There was empathy there. there was, you know, she gave, gave me positivity. She signposted me onto courses, adult courses, power of positive thinking, things like that. And... You know, as time went on, my life got better. Mm -hmm. um, being, like I said, the, the book helped me quite a bit. Um, about a few years ago, I went to Manchester Survivors. I know Duncan Craig quite well. Um, and I went to the safe rooms. I went to one-to-one -one therapy there as well. And it was the survivors that actually got me to open up and talk freely about what happened and help take the power from the rapists. You know, because at the end of the day, rape is about control. And at that particular time, they've, they've virtually killed me. You know, they didn't, they didn't put me in the recovery position or anything like that. They just did what they did and left me for dead because to silence me, 
they uh, they basically put it put me quilt over my head, which stopped me from breathing. So I suffocated unconscious. And that is the thing that really impacts on me. You know, the thing that really sticks in my mind. Um, but being that I went to, um, to um, Manchester Survivors, and uh, I'm, I'm, I still go there now, actually. Uh, but it's mainly done on Zoom now. I go to the safe rooms and things like that. Um, and they helped me quite a bit. You know, I'm, in, I'm, I'm a lot better off than what I was because it used to be, they, in a way, give me the confidence to finish my book because I, I published my book last November. Sales aren't great, but, you know, at least I've got it out there. I've took the control back of my life. Um, and it and it was it was helpful getting it out on paper, you know, getting it out of my head where it was just rattling around and not doing me any good. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I understand that. Uh, writing a book is quite cathartic. Yeah. Um, you know, doing things to focus your mind on anything is um, quite cathartic as well. Yeah. Um, I've found it, you know, um, it's helped me over the past, coming up to a year now, um, deal with my trauma. Um, as, as I spoke with um, Jay Haston um, a couple of weeks ago about building a trauma-informed society, um, and not just that, but working with trauma ourselves, because I don't believe that we can get well in ourselves until we start looking at our trauma yeah. uh, you, you know that is part and parcel of the 12 step program for me yeah. looking at the trauma is, is a big one uh, and, tackling, yeah. um, and that's where I failed so many times you know I, I've, I've got seven years seven years and one day yeah. um, behind me because I've this time I've, I've looked into my trauma um, you know uh, I think some people might have a few questions, yeah. um, if you don't mind answering. No. Uh, have a look. Um, da -da 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 -da. <laughs> Teresa Crowley asked, um, for, for those that are joining late, um, I'm with uh, Terry Anton. Um, author of Three Wise Monkeys, and he's, he's sharing about his life. Could you just re re reiterate um, what you did that got you in the papers? I think some people missed it. Right. Well, basically, it was an ind indiscretion to do with um, my curtains. I used to, right. I used to have a bath and then sit naked in my living room. Which, right. if you think, if you think you're in the privacy of your bed, of your living room or bedroom, whichever, um, you know, you, you're oblivious. I didn't mm. know that my neighbours uh, were doing all kinds of ways to spy on me. Even looking right. through a vent in my bedroom, I caught them doing it once. Uh, this is down London. So it's totally different. And being the fact that I lived on a, a main road, a crowd right. on a main road didn't look out of place. You know, right. so that's basically what set it off. Plus the fact uh, I was in the papers for parking the car on the main line. Uh, right. I was in the evening post probably the sun and things like that. Th thanks for, um, thanks for clearing that up. Um, so, uh, how was that dealt with? Was that dealt with with the police or did it just, you, you weren't charged or anything for that, were you? No, I was uh, totally oblivious to it. 
because it lasted for something like three months. And because I wasn't a paper reader, people were talking to me through the paper because they were getting paid for it. But because I wasn't a paper reader, I wasn't getting what they were saying. So basically it was all done behind my back. Right. You know? And this Bizarre, was in the 80s? Uh, Mid-80s to 93. Brilliant. Um, let's see if I have more questions. Hang on, sorry. My phone's just gone funny on me. <laughs> um, <laughs> There we go. Yeah, Dawn Blade said that, um, goodness, you should be allowed to do what you want in your own home. Um, you'd think so, wouldn't you? You know, and, yeah, you'd you think, think so. and you'd think that a paper would be genuine enough to actually knock at your door, but they don't. You know, um, spit and image were quite spot on about tabloid journalists, put it that way. If you remember mm. how they used to portray them, they, it was quite spot on. Yeah. Sorry if that's controversial. <laughs> no, uh, it's, uh, this, um, this podcast is uh, not just for me, it's to give a voice um, to people like you and, and, and former criminals and people that have, have stories to tell, um, to be a podium for that. Um, you know, it's not about me always sharing about my life. P people have heard a lot of it anyway. So um, yeah. where can we buy your book? It's on Waterstones and it's in Amazon. Um, Amazon, it's on paperback and it's on the ebooks as well. Obviously, a bit cheaper on ebooks. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I will put a, a link into this uh, once we're finished. Um, so, how long did it take you to write your book? Uh, well, the strange thing is. Um, when I got my computer, which would have been in 2000, I, I made a start on it, but I probably only did 100 pages. Oh. Um, and what I tended to do was to write a bit, read a bit, you know, go through it again, add bits. And altogether, I think it took me about five years. Oh. Um, finding a, a publisher wasn't really a problem. I think that took about six months. Hmm. Um, and he's quite a good publisher. You know, he's got a lot of um, kudos, is it? You know, it's yeah. got a good reputation. Eye to eye publishing. Yeah. Eye to eye publishing. Yeah. I'll take a look at that as well. Um, book um, yeah I think that's it mate um, did you have anything else that you wanted to get across no I'll, I'll probably think of something when we finish but <laughs> for now no <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, uh, thank it's, you it's for giving me one. this up yeah thank you for giving me this opportunity it's a pleasure very grateful pleasure um thanks for tuning in guys if you if, if you stay on for a moment um i'll sign off and then we'll have a quick chat all right hi guys thanks for tuning in uh, as always um and i shall see you again next week um i'm trying to arrange one for monday um which will be um possibly Hayley cullen talking about um escaping domestic violence um so thanks as always guys uh, and i shall see you soon Bye. thank you